Hi, this is a short video explaining some of the concepts that have been co covered so far in the class. Um, start with this very basic question. So what's the point of the slide deck? Uh, provide you with the overall picture of the various topics of the course covered so far. Uh, we've covered quite a bit um, and it might be hard for you to understand how each one of those parts fit in. Uh, so this will give you an overall picture so that you understand how they all relate to one another. Uh, so the, I think the first simplest question, and we've been building a lot of models. We've been working with different data sets and creating models that accomplish uh, try to, um, different models that tries to predict different parameters. Um, so I think the, you know, the plainest question is, why do we even create these models in the first place? Um, you, depending on the situation, you may get different answers on what the point of models are. Um, there are many ways you can kind of think about this. Um, some people say it's basic to a way to trade off, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of different reasons why models are extremely useful, um, but I'll put it in our perspective for our class, really ultimately it comes down to, um, you know, can we make models that have high predictive power? That's the main purpose in this class. Okay, so for our class, a good model is one with high predictive ability. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's able to tell us what's going to happen in the future based on what's happened in the past. Uh, so if you look at generally a model is some kind of a representation of a real world system. Um, so, you know, let's say in the real world, we have the spread of the turtle flu, uh, some kind of a uh, disease or a virus that's spreading and affecting human population. Um, we can't really, you know, test uh, what's going to happen to the spread of that flu um, out in the real world as easily because you can just start changing things around as we want and see the effects. So instead, we try to model what would happen in the real world using a mathematical model. So we build a the mathematical model of the real world system, okay? And then for our model, we want to know, for example, a certain output, like, you know, the we want to predict the number of infections for 100,000 people uh, for the infection rate. So in the real world, we could actually measure this in the real world. So um, we know we can get data from the real world, um, you know, of this measurement. Uh, number of infections over 100,000 people or the infection rate. Um, and then we could build a, we can use our model then and figure out what parameters affect that output. So just as an example, let's say X1 is one of the parameters, um, percentage of people who are vaccinated to the virus, uh, X2 could be the percentage of population with underlying chronic conditions. The argument is, is that these two parameters affect the number of infections for every 100,000 people. Okay, so these x x one variables are our inputs, and our output variable is a y variable, and a dependent variable is the number of infections per hundred thousand people. So our model tries to predict y based on any value of x one and x two. Okay, so the argument is then in the real world, if we know what x one and x two is in the real world, we can replicate this in the model and see what our model tells us. In the real world, then. Um, if x if in the real world, if x one were to be some value and x two were to be some value, this would happen. This is what what would happen in the real world. Okay, they're trying to predict what would happen in the real world. Okay, so that's really the point of uh, making of uh, models in our class. We want models with high predictive ability. And the next question is then, how do you actually create good models? Um, so we know we need some input parameters x one, x two, and to produce the output of y. We want models with high predictive power for y, and then we have to decide which parameters x1, x2, x3, however many there are, how, which one of these variables are important in terms of determining y, our output variable or the dependent variable. So we use existing data to create these models. Uh, there's only two types of models we've actually covered so far, which is a linear regression or linear regression model. Um, and they're, they, they work very similarly. Uh, it really comes down to the nature of the output variable you're trying to predict. Um, if you're trying to predict the number of infections for 100,000 people, you would use the linear regression because the output would be some linear number, linear variable. So, you know, the value will range from anywhere from you know zero to you know 100,000 supposedly, but it could be you know it could range from it could be decimal values, it could be any range of values, right? But you know, if the if the y value is actually whether or not a person is infected. It, and that's a logistic regression model, okay? Because the variable we're trying to predict is a binary variable. It's a yes or a no, one or a zero, or a true or false. Therefore, uh, so 
the the question of whether you use a linear logistic regression model depends on the dependent the nature of that dependent variable. Uh, if it's a linear, if it's a uh, some kind of a numeric variable, um, then it's a linear regression. If it's a binary variable, then it's a logistic regression model. Okay, so um, both of these models, whether linear logistic, they use independent variables x1, x2, x3, etc., to predict a dependent variable y. Um, so it's it's going to use a set of independent variables to predict y. Uh, we want these x x uh, variables to be not not collinear. So we want them to be independent. Okay, so we don't we want to avoid collinearity. Okay, we want these nice clean variables that do not have any relation among themselves. Okay, so the way we you know create our models, um, once we decided whether we're building a linear regression or logistic regression model, is uh, very very similar. Um, so we're gonna use either forward selection or backward selection. So the first two rows of those two tables to, of the table to, shows you whether you're building a linear regression model or logistic regression model. You can use the forward selection or the backward selection method. The forward selection method means you add one variable at a time to your model until you're no, you're, you're satisfied. Okay, so um, ultimately the type of models that we want is what's called a parsimonious model. That means the fewest number of variables and still has a high performance. So in forward selection, if you're doing a linear regression, um, you're gonna add one variable at a time until, for example, your adjusted R square value no longer increases if you're using adjusted R square as a parameter. Um, same idea with logistic regression, but adjusted R square doesn't exist in a logistic regression model. So we use what's called an AIC parameter. It's analogous to adjusted R square, but in this case, we want the lowest AIC, not the highest AIC. For adjusted R square, we want the highest adjusted R square. Uh, that's per iteration, right? So. You start with one variable models, you pick the one with the highest adjusted R squared, move on to two variable models, pick the highest adjusted R squared, and then to the three variable models, pick the highest adjusted, adjusted R squared, et cetera. Um, instead of using adjusted R squared or AIC, we could, all use the, we could also use a p-value criteria. Uh, this one's a lot quicker or easier to implement um, in a sense that you, all you have to look at is a p-value, and if it's over 5%, um, and if anything over 5%, out of the ones that are over 5%, you remove, if you're doing forward selection, oh, sorry, if you're doing backward selection, you're removing the variable with the highest p-value, okay? So backward selection is the complete opposite of forward selection where you start with the full model and you start removing one variable at a time until you see no, no more improvement, okay? So then that's, it's the same way for linear regression or discretion. So let's say I'm using p-value now for variable selection. Then I'm gonna remove one variable at a time until all of my variables are uh, at a significant p-value, so under 5%. Um, now at an iteration, if I see multiple variables that are above 5%, I'm gonna pick the one with the highest p-value and remove that variable, okay? Then this, and the method works exactly the same way, whether it's linear regression or logistic regression. Um, the R function to call or the R function R function or the R call to build a model is LM for linear regression and GLM for logistic regression. And I gave you a, a rough example on the screen there. Um, so this is how we build good models. Uh, we're going to use either adjusted R square or AIC if it's logistic regression or use p-value, uh, either whether you're using linear regression or digit regression. Uh, and we could use forward selection or backward selection. Once you build a model, um, you know, with a good adjusted R square or all of the uh, p-values that's 5% significance, this doesn't actually guarantee that your model is going to be the best performing model. Um, you know, it's really our best guess, but, you know, we don't, we can't really guarantee anything on the actual performance on a testing set. So once you build a good model using one of these methods, how do you then, you know, how can you measure whether or not your model is good, okay? So how do you measure our model's performance? Uh, we need to measure whether our model actually performs well on the testing set. So this is the data that was not used to build a model. We use a training set to build a model. So this is a completely new data set that model has never seen. So if our model does really well on the testing set, we know then that our model generalizes very well. 
and it could be very effective in new, some of these newer cases. Um, so if you're using linear regression, what we typically use uh, or, or the prim main parameter we use in class was RMSC. Um, the R call or the R function to make predictions using your model is a predict function. I gave you an example there uh, where the, the name of my model is model and the name of my testing set is called test. Um, the, so, you know, if you're trying to measure, if you're trying to compare different models against each other based on model performance, you want the model with the lowest RMSC, uh, strictly speaking. And there are other things you got to think about, but you could argue that the one with the lowest RMSC is the best performing model on the test set. Now for logistic regression, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, the R called R function to make prediction using the logistic regression is given on the, on, on the lower right hand corner of that table. It's the same predict function, but you got to give it one more parameter, which is the type argument. And you got to put uh, the response um, quotes, response and quotes there. Um, so how do you measure performance for a logistic regression model? One way to do it is you're looking at the AEC value, which is the area under the curve. The argument, you can make the argument that, that the, um, the model with the highest AEC is the best performing model for any given test, for that given test set. Um, but it's a little bit nuanced than that. So you got to think about a few things before you can really say this model is the best one. The way you select a model or the way you like, uh, you know, create the model is similar again with linear regression, backward elimination, forward elimination, et cetera. Um, so let's look at logistic regression strictly, okay? So for logistic regression, um, if you want to measure effectiveness of the logistic regression model, um, we really need to uh, calculate the sensitivity specificity and the accuracy. There are other parameters that we are interested in, but we're, we haven't um, you know, covered it for the course yet, or we haven't, I haven't talked about it in detail. So um, for our discussion for now, uh, we're just strictly gonna look at sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Um, since the logistic regression models produce a probability value, um, you know, when you actually run the model, the output you get from the model is not a zero or one, but a probability, probability value. So we need to, basically classify or basically map those values into a zero or one or false or true or no or yes. So um, it depends on the threshold value. So our logistic regression model, we give it some inputs and the outputs are gonna be predictive values. Those values again are not, you know, yes or no or zero or one. We, if they're gonna be a value from zero or one, we're gonna use what's called a threshold value. Uh, it's gonna be 0 0.5 by default. Uh, but we could change this. Um, and then we use that threshold value to create a confusion matrix. So if our if our map output sample is, for example, greater than T, assuming that our threshold value are, are is T, if our out, if our model outputs for, for a given sample, if our if our model outputs a value greater than T, then my model predicts one for that sample, uh, or a true or yes. Um, if the value is under T, less than T, then my model predicts zero or false or no. Yeah. Taking those results, then I can create a confusion matrix. So let's say this is an example with T equals 0 0.5. This lists out all of the outcomes. So the value on the lower right-hand corner are the values where my model predicted true and it was actually true. The 52 is number of cases where my model predicted true and it was actually true, okay? Uh, this 80 here, this is a value where my model predicted zero or no. In this case, no means deny, yes means approve. Uh, this is the case, the eight is the number of cases that my model predicted zero, and it was actually zero um, in the real world, in the real data. Okay. So if I were to change the threshold value to 0.2 though, if, 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 for the same set of outputs from my model, I'll get a different confusion matrix because again, the threshold change, so you know, the way you map those probability values into an actual prediction of zero or one changes. So in this case, with the same exact output from my model, um, there are 70 cases in which my model said one and the data actually showed one. There are 21 cases where my model predicted zero and the data actually shows also zero as well, okay? Um, the sensitivity for my one T was 0 0.5 is the number of the times my model predicted it correctly over the total number of cases or true cases or one case. Uh, 
for the same model output with a different t threshold value, my sensitivity actually changes, it goes up. And that kind of makes sense because the threshold value got smaller. That means my model is predicting one more frequently. And so it's gonna catch a lot of those true cases more often. So my sensitivity goes up. Um, but the specificity in my original case was higher. So it's 80 divided by 80 plus 13. So all of the actual zero cases. But when the threshold goes down, uh, my model is worse at this parameter because it's not picking up the zero cases as well. So that's again, the inherent trade-off that's shown by the ROC curve. Um, the overall accuracy of these two models also change again because of the way I chose my threshold value, okay? So the way you assess performance between a linear regression and a logistic regression model are different. Um, so you gotta be able to understand why they're different. Um, and you know, hopefully this gives you a good, good overall picture on all of the um, topics that we've covered so far related to one another. Okay, thanks for watching, bye.